Hello, and thank you for joining us for this Food Co-op Initiative webinar, Owner Loans 201, A Deep Dive. This will be our second dive on this topic, the nitty-gritty details of how to run your owner loan campaign. So just a little bit about Food Co-op Initiative before we get started. We are a small nonprofit that works nationally. We're working with startups all the way from Sitka, Alaska to Boston, Massachusetts that supports communities that are trying to start their own food co-ops in their communities. We have helped over 80 food co-ops open across the nation and are working now with over 120 additional communities across the nation working on their own food co-ops. We exist to support startup food co-ops at all stages in development, whether you just had your first conversation about the possibility of maybe starting one to you're about to open your doors in a couple days, you can call us at any time. There's our number on the screen or email us at info at fci.coop. You can sign up for our mailing list and take a look at our extensive resources on our website as well. We have webinars, we have workbooks, uh, fact sheets, all sorts of things there that are free for your use that can support you in starting your food co-op. I want to give a quick thank you to our sponsors. One of our main sponsors is the USDA, as well as the National Cooperative Bank, National Cooperative Grocers, the Cooperative Fund, and the Cooperative, the, uh, the Cooperative Foundations are in the Cooperative Fund of New England, as well as dozens of mature food co-ops all across the US that donate to food co-op initiatives work to help support the next generation of food co-ops. Thank you for making our work possible. We couldn't do it without you. A few quick points of housekeeping. We are recording today, and this recording will be available on our Food Co-op Initiative website as well as on our YouTube channel. So if you like what you see today and you want to review it or share it with other board members and organizers of your co-op, you can do that at our website or at our YouTube channel. We have an extensive library of webinars there on both our YouTube channel and our website. Check them out. And if you we want your questions, this is live and interactive, and it works best if we hear from you. So you can email us at any time during this presentation at info at fci.coop, and those questions will be passed on to the presenter at the end of her presentation. All right, we are ready to dive into Owner Loans 201. We're welcoming back Katie Novak. Katie is the Outreach Manager and Owner Loan Campaign Manager at Green Tap Grocery. Green Tap Grocery is located um, in Nor Bloomington Normal, Illinois. They are a Stage 3A co-op. They have broken ground. They have a location, a general manager, and they are well known for the fact that they raised $1.3 million in member loans from their community. Is it because the community was particularly wealthy or really high population? Neither of those things. It's because they ran a terrific campaign. And we've been taking advantage of the opportunity to learn from the mastermind behind this amazing campaign through a series of webinars. We've actually done two previous webinars with Katie that you can check out again on our YouTube channel or our website. We're also going to have a link at the end of this presentation to a site we've set up with just her webinars as well as all of the extensive documents um, and other links that she's shared of pieces that they created that you can use as a reference. So with that said, welcome Katie. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming back a third time. I'm going to turn it over to you and you can let us know what we're going to dive into this time. Okay, great. Well, today um, we're going to talk just quickly about what we talked about in our last webinar. Um, we, we did some basic um, owner loan campaign um, information, so we'll talk about that quickly. And then we'll talk about the day-to-day -day operations of a campaign and some things that we created at Green Top to kind of help us stay on track. So that's kind of our progress for the, for the day. And then at the end, we'll have time for Q&A, as Jacqueline said. So make sure to send your questions in. We'd love to answer them. So um, basically, a, a recap of what we talked about in our last webinar. Um, there's a lot of groundwork that goes into preparing for our known or loan campaign. So if this is the first time that you're watching this series, um, please make sure that you take a look at the previous webinars because we did go through a lot of things and they're all very critical to the success of your campaign. 
We talked about legal document preparation and securing your database, making sure that your marketing materials and your communication plan are all in sync. They've got a streamlined way to communicate with your volunteers and you've got a way to train them and keep everyone on, on project and on goal. You know, we also talked about budget, which is also very important. And then specifics about workflow and job descriptions and the actual kickoff of the event and, and how to have a good team meeting with your group. Um, and so all of this information, like Jacqueline said, is available on their website with some, some um, templates that you can use that we created that you can tweak to fit your co-op. But before we get too far into this, I just want to reiterate that the things we're going to talk about here today are really deep topics. Um, so we want to make sure all of these other things are done before we start working on the things we're going to talk about today. So a day in the life of a campaign manager. Um, this is a, a just a snippet of some photos that we took during our campaign, but it kind of gives you an idea of the energy level. You can see there's a lot of excitement and a lot of action, a lot of people, um, a lot of visuals. And so um, that's kind of a description of the day of the life of a campaign manager. You're going from thing to thing and it's exciting and you're talking to lots of people, but it's also um, very time consuming and exhausting. So this is just an outline of what happens in the day of a, of a campaign manager, um, just to kind of give you an idea of what your campaign manager, if that person is you or perhaps someone um, in your organization, or maybe you're looking for that person, but this is a pilot, what, um, what will happen in their campaign. So we don't have to go through this in great detail, but I do want you to see that it is, it's a 12 hour day. Um, you know, you're starting, I started at 9 a.m. because I'm not a morning person, and uh, that was about as early as I could get at it. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, you're gonna spend some time, you know, sorting through emails, responding to owners, responding to board members, and you have to tally up your work. So the calls from the night before, you have to count those and make sure that they're accurately recorded and that you're sending the right information to the right people. And then you've got to communicate that. So you're going to spend some time on your email communication, whether that be a video update or an email newsletter. And then you're going to get people joining you and your volunteers are going to show up and they're going to help you, you know, update your database and document your folders and make sure your call sheets are all accounted for and, and accurately alphabetized and in the right folders. And so it's quite, it's, and that's just halfway through the day, you know, that we're just at lunch now, basically, and, and you've already done all this work. So um, there's a lot to it. Um, you're probably going to get media inquiries. So there's, there's time allotted in here for uh, response to a media outlet that calls and says, hey, what's happening with your campaign? <clears throat> then you have to proof your email that you're going to send. You, you drafted it, and maybe a volunteer put it together for you, but now you have to proof it and get it out. Um, and make sure that you post it to Facebook as well. And you're, then you're going to get more emails, more people are going to ask you questions. And then you have to schedule meetings with potential large donors. You know, these, these folks that we need, to, we have to set time aside to make those contacts and get in touch with those people. And then, um, thankfully, we had uh, a fundraising expert who lived locally and was a Green Top owner. And um, I often meet with him and he would give me a little pep talk and see how things were going and keeps on track. So that would get me through the afternoon. And then probably, you know, around the 4, 4.30 time frame, um, you're going to start getting lenders coming in. People are going to get off work. They're going to want to complete their paperwork. So you're going to meet with them. Um, I might snag some M&Ms or make a quick call to my husband, make sure he's still alive <laughs> at that point. But then some more people are going to show up. Um, they're going to want to fill out their paperwork or ask questions about the campaign. And then before you know it, it's time to start making calls. And you've got to get your, your room ready. You've got to get the supplies in, in order. You've got to make sure all your stats are updated and clearly visible to your call team. So when they walk in the room, they know exactly what's happened since the last time they were there. And if I'm lucky, maybe my husband will have dropped off dinner by then or uh, someone will have uh, dropped off some snacks for us. And then we also, one, one thing we did um, was create a no board, and we'll talk about that um, a little bit later, but making sure that's up and ready when callers get there is important. And then people are going to start showing up to make calls. So you're going to catch up with them, you're going to check in with them, make sure that they're up to date on what's happening. And then the action starts. So 
So you're going to answer questions. A lot of the time um, of a campaign manager is going to be is going to be spent answering questions and putting out fires. You know, so this this isn't working, or we've never had this before. How do we do this? And making sure that um, the callers have everything they need and they get their questions answered, so that the owners have the right answers to the questions. And so we'll, if you're lucky, you'll get to make a few calls as well, and those are always fun. And then, um, you know, it's the end of the night. You've got to wrap things up, return the supplies, secure your paperwork, make sure everything's locked up and secure. And then you go home, go to bed, and you do it the next day. So it is quite, uh, it's quite a day. It's, and, and you're going to do this every day for the length of your campaign. So four weeks, six weeks, sometimes eight weeks. Um, and it's, it can be exhausting. But then, you know, great notes like this will come in the mail. And um, I'm not sure if you can see it or not, but it says good luck from Kelly um, at, a, at another co-op locally. She's the board president of another co-op. And she sent um, a nice donation to our campaign and just said, hey, keep it up. You're doing great work. And things like that really keep you going, even though it seems like it's a lot and it seems like it might be exhausting. These are the kinds of things that keep you excited and motivated. And it's a lot like conducting a symphony. I really like this graphic that uh, Mary from the Food Co-op Initiative used to um, to um, promote this this webinar. There's a lot of pieces and a lot of people involved, and you have to keep everyone on the same page and moving in the same direction, and um, have and they have to have access to all of the information that they need. So it is a bunch. You know, it's very similar to a to a symphony, um, and I, and I think I really like that that graphic and it kind of depicts exactly what's happening. It's keeping a lot of people moving in the same direction at the same time. So let's talk about some tools then that you can use to keep you on track. So I think it's important to set a process for your call night or a standard flow so that callers know that they can expect the same thing to happen every time they show up. They know you know where they're going to find the information they need. You know what information they need. They know where it's at, how to use it, and you want to make sure that that the night flows pretty similarly every night, so that you can get into a pattern and a routine. For us, you know, the first 15 minutes of the call night was a lot of catch up, a lot of how you doing, you know, what's happening in your life, a lot of what's happening in the campaign, you know, eating some snacks, hanging out a little bit, kind of getting comfortable and getting settled. But it's also then the time where you're you're making sure you have everything you need. You have all your call sheets, um, you have all of your stats ready. And then as the campaign manager, you, you want to make sure you're actively posting to Facebook. So as callers are showing up, you're taking their picture or you're posting a snapshot of them on their first call for the night and you know some some funny caption like, hey we're Answer your phone. We're calling you tonight, um, and and then you're actively posting throughout the night as things happen. If you get loans or something funny happens, you're you're continuing to take pictures and utilize social media to your advantage. And then if you have time, if there is time, uh, the campaign manager will make some calls. Um, that was that was a huge part of of being the manager was also talking to owners and um, securing loans. And then you're going to want to allow some flexibility to your structure. So although you know you have a structure to your evening, you want to allow some flexibility to that. So you know if someone can't show up until a little later, or maybe they like to work in a quieter space. You know, make sure that you can accommodate those things, but still, still keeping the structure in place so that they have what they need, so they can do it in an environment in a way that makes sense for them. And then one nice thing that we used was a no board. And I used this um, technique from, a, from the days that I unfortunately worked in sales. <laughs> um, but we knew, I knew that every time someone told us no, we were closer to a yes. And we also knew that about 25% of our owners were gonna make a loan. So that told me that you know every four or five no's we get, we will get a yes. So um, on our no board, we had every caller's name, and then we had no written at the top. So every time we got a no, we would put a tick mark by our name. And sometimes it was one person who did all the tick marks, or sometimes you know people would get up on their bathroom break and 
write down their tick marks or whatever. But um, but we were keeping track of how many times we got a no. So when we had four no's, we were getting pretty excited. You know, like there's a yes coming here, people. You know, we're ready for it. Who's it gonna be? Um, and that was really helpful for us. And then we kept track of those over time. And then we could see, we could compare how many calls we were getting, how many no's we were getting to how many yeses we were getting. And that was kind of fun to see how those statistics played out. Yeah. We also created some email templates, which I would highly recommend because you're going to be communicating a lot. They tell you that, you know, you know you're communicating enough when someone says you're communicating too much. So um, making that as easy as you can on yourself is really important. So using um, some standards, I think, is important. So some things that we did, uh, we always include the total number of loans we had, the total amount we had pledged to date, the percentage of goal, how close we were to our goal, um, the number of lenders that are of owners who had participated, and then how much we had left to reach. We started including that towards the end because that number got smaller and smaller. And that's exciting for people to see. So um, the, the graphic that you see there, let's fill the gap, um, that was created by our board president, Melanie Shelato, who does great graphic design work. And that's something we use in the second phase of our campaign. And so that was in every email we sent out. And then these stats that you, that you see above followed that in a pretty standard format. So that when we updated that email, we were just updating a few numbers. Um, we weren't recreating the wheel every time. And then that allowed a volunteer to help. So we, as long as that volunteer had access to the data, to the updated statistics, they could update the email and get it out. So having some of those standard things in place um, was really helpful for us and allowed us to get more done um, without recreating the wheel. So some social media templates. Um, we also created some templates. Uh, we, our, our great graphic designer created this key image, which we really liked, and I think really speaks to the fact that we needed owners to step forward if we were gonna open our doors. And um, this was very well received. But again, most of our social media posts included this key to some extent. Um, the graphic that you see at the bottom was our cover image on Facebook. And then the varying versions of the op of the graphic that you see on the right were used as we moved along in the campaign. So it was very easy for us to just, you know, when we got to 700,000, we could just pull that key. It was already pre-created. All the lines were filled in to the right numbers. And we could use that then in a standard post every time we hit a benchmark. So we didn't have to recreate the wheel. We didn't have to go to the graphic designer and say, oh my gosh, we're almost to 800,000. Can you fill it into 800? Um, it worked out very well. And then having some standardized standardized posts available as well was helpful. Then a, a volunteer also could take those standardized posts, plug the key image in, and post it for us. Helped us tremendously. Uh, you can also use the scheduling tool within Facebook to, to make your life a little easier as well. And a lot of your posts are going to be um, on-the-go kind of posts, like, Julie Smith just made a loan. You know, you can't really, you can't schedule that out. That just happens and you want to share it with people. But what you can schedule out is, you know, it's day 33 of our campaign and we need you to participate. More general posts. Um, so you're keeping interest about the campaign up, but you're not necessarily taking time away to do that. You're scheduling that ahead of time or having a volunteer schedule those. So that's also something that was helpful for us. And then um, considering a video update was also um, a good a good tip we got from Jacqueline for the second phase of our campaign. We kind of changed our messaging a little bit, made it a little more interactive, and uh, we have a we'll at least have a link to that, and we'll get to talk through that a little bit as we well here we are yeah. So um, this is a copy or a, a version of our of our um, video. Uh, it's about thirty seconds long, and you won't be able to hear the audio. But what you'll see is me holding up signs. And that's basically what we were doing is just holding up stats. That was our number of owners. This is how much we had raised so far in the second phase of the campaign. And then we talked about how many new loans we had and how many lenders had increased their loans. Our total uh, raised to date. And then we had a calendar that we crossed days off. So as we got to the end of the month, we were like, you know, there's only six days left, or only five days left. 
And so it was a visual depiction then of the urgency of participating now. Um, so it was important for folks to kind of see that. And then we always included the phone number to Green Top and my email address. If people had questions or they wanted to make their loan or get more involved, they knew how to do it. So you can see it's very simple. Um, this was just a webcam on my computer. And I was just using colored paper and markers, nothing fancy or involved. Um, but we always talked about the same stats. So the same stats that I talked about in the newsletter or in your email updates, you can use in a video too. And you want to keep it short. You know, people aren't going to watch a two or three minute video, unfortunately. So we found the 30 to 60 second window was about the sweet spot for us. And then smile. You know, you might be exhausted and tired and worn out, but um, having an upbeat attitude, smiling, making people feel like, oh, yeah, I could call in. She seems like I could talk to her. She'd answer my questions was important. Um, and making sure that the tone of the email or the video was was positive. So, you know, sometimes we weren't meeting our goal. Not, you know, we would say, hey, we didn't get as much as we needed this week. But maintaining that positive attitude while being honest um, was important, too. And then use your background to um, to promote your your message too. So you could see the key there in the background was important. So kind of use your space as much as you could. Um, some other things that we did to kind of help us uh, keep on track. So your board is going to want updates. You know they're going to want to know how everything is going. You know how many loans you're getting, how many calls. They're going to want things maybe the public might not be interested in. So they're going to want to know. You know how many calls have we made? How far through our how far through our owner list are we? You know, have we gotten to everyone yet? How many times have we contacted each person? So you're going to have to find out exactly what we're looking for, and that may start out being X, Y, and Z, and end up being you know A, B, and D uh, when it's all said and done. But Having a standard template available so you can plug the numbers in that they're looking for when you know what they are is, is very helpful for us. And what we did, um, we created a, a page of our spreadsheet, of our database, where we kept track of our lenders and our owners um, with that data. And thankfully, we had a great person working on that database, so most of the numbers just fed right into that page from as we updated data. Um, per lender, per owner, would update to that to the board sheet as well. So we could just cut that from that page and send it to in an email to the owners or to the board on a weekly basis. And then, of course, that's going to change. You know, they're going to say, hey, what about this stat or that stat or, or how many people have, you know, made a pledge but not followed through on their commitment. Things that we wouldn't talk about necessarily to the public, but that the board might be interested in. And then setting a calendar reminder for yourself to do that. Um, you know, I, I, I rely on my calendar a lot to keep me on track. So if I know every Tuesday I have to do this, you know, I just put it on my calendar. So being it pops up, oh, yep, I need to send that board report. Um, and using that as your kind of mechanism to keep you on track. We also talked in the, in the last webinar about our budget. So setting a budget is really important for your campaign. You want to know, you know what kind of funds you have available and when you can use them and, and how you're going to use them. Um, but setting the budget is only half of the process. You have to actually use the budget. So you have to know as you're going, you know, how much money have I spent ordering pizza for my callers? Or, you know, how much money have we spent printing documents do i can i print i have this great idea for a new piece do we have the funds in the budget for me to print this now um so using your budget as you go is important so updating your expenditures as you incur them so that you know how much you have left in your budget and then you it's also an easy go-to place when it's been a rough day and you know maybe we've had a drought in loans and you know we aren't getting the activity that we need and we feel like our callers could really use a boost I can look quickly at the budget and say, hey, there's a little money in here. You know, we can order cookies for tonight or we can stop and get ice cream for everyone. So it's important um, that you use that budget and use it to take care of your people. You know, they're your biggest asset. They're the reason why your campaign will be successful. So make sure if there is money in the budget that you spend it on your people.
So agreed upon policies were also um, important to us in our campaign. We established for our group some meeting standards. So we knew exactly what time our meeting started, that we expected it you know, to start promptly, and that the expectation was that everyone attended. And then some other things that probably happen in, in other meetings that you've been involved with, like, you know, allowing everyone to participate in the meeting and not talking over people and um, being considerate of everyone's opinion and sharing openly and honestly with each other so that we were all kind of on the same page and, and knew and trusted each other and trusted that this meeting was going to be a productive use of our time. And I think that was helpful for us. Um, also, setting expectations was important for the group, um, and I don't think we did this uh, specifically. You know, we didn't. I didn't say I oh, expect you to do this, this, and this. But um, when a when a caller said I'm going to attend this meeting, and I'm going to show up on Tuesday, um, and I'll be here on Thursday. Uh, so they show up on they show up for the meeting, and they come on Tuesday, and then Thursday rolls around, and I don't see them. They're not here at the time that they say they're going to be. I almost always called that person within 15 minutes of the start of when they should have been there just to check in. And primarily I did it because I'm a worry wart and I want to make sure they were okay. You know, like there wasn't a car accident or a flat tire or anything like that. But I realized that doing that expressed to them how important it was that they, they be where they said they would be and that they do what they had committed to doing. And what that did then was allow them to contact me, it allowed them to feel comfortable saying to me ahead of time, hey, Katie, I know I signed up for Thursday, but I'm not going to be able to make it. And then I could fill that space and I knew ahead of time that we could, we could manage that. So it worked out well to do that. And then um, also following up with folks who don't attend. So for example, a meeting, if they, if they weren't able to attend a meeting, I made sure that we sat down and talked. You know, we went through the high points of the meeting, maybe it wouldn't take an hour like it did for the meeting time frame, but we could hit the high points and that they knew it was important that they attend. So that they weren't gonna get out of the obligation altogether. They had to, to participate to some degree. So I think that was important. And then also creating a fun environment. I think that was really a key to, to our success is that the team felt like we were a team. We had a good time together. We enjoyed each other. We gave out prizes, we laughed at funny calls. I think I've probably never laughed harder than I have at some of these calls. We talked to people. People will tell you the craziest things. Um, they will tell you they're, they're prepping for a colonoscopy. They'll tell you they're giving the cat a bath. I mean, just crazy things. You're like, oh, okay, well maybe we should talk at another time. <laughs> but um, capitalizing on that and sharing those moments among the team is really important and I think one thing we've talked about previously is having callers in a group setting so you can do that is really important. Because when you're, when you're calling your, from home, isolated from everyone else, something hilarious might happen, but it's harder to share that electronically or you know, via email or anything like that. So I like having people together to make calls, and I think that um, that was successful for us. And then uh, our meetings. So weekly meetings were fun. Uh, we met every Thursday at 5:30, and that meeting always included thank yous. You know, we talked about great things people would, people were doing, but we also talked sincerely about how appreciative we were of each other and the work we were doing. And I think that helped us um, be successful at our team meetings. Um, we always had an agenda, so people knew ahead of time what to expect. We knew exactly the date and time of the meeting because we standardized that. We always included food and drinks, which I think is important. Um, and our meetings took place at 5.30, 5 or 5.30, I can't remember for sure. And then we started calls at 6.30. So they had kind of had to include food or we would have starved to death. So that, that was a critical piece. And it's fun to, to involve food. Sometimes it was a potluck, sometimes we ordered pizza, you know, sometimes people brought their own dinner, but um, we did always include that. And we did always have our meetings at the same place. So, um, and we had them at the same, at the place we were going to be making calls from. So there was no transition period. There's no moving from one spot to the other, or we could just transition from meeting to call time. And, um, and that worked out well for us. So I've included a sample agenda here. So you can kind of get an idea 
of what we would talk about in our meetings. They lasted probably 45 to 60 minutes, depending on the week. But we always started with the stats review. So we always started out talking about numbers. So, you know, how many loans we had, um, who, who had made the most loans, talk, always started with the stats. And then we'd move into any kind of procedure changes or reminders. So if I had heard, you know, three or four people not mentioning X when they were talking, and X is really important, you know, I'd say, hey, you guys, remember the importance of X when we're having these calls. We want to make sure that we're including this in our, in our conversations with folks. But also we'd talk about procedure changes, you know, like this piece of paper does not go in that folder anymore. We're going to put it on the table instead. And, and those kinds of logistical things um, that change as the campaign goes. We were keeping everyone on the same page that way. And then, of course, we did awards. Um, and I just pulled an I just pulled an agenda from one of the meetings. And this was these are the real awards from one meeting. Funniest call, most loans to date, and most peaceful spirit. I have no idea where most peaceful spirit came from. I don't remember. But clearly, whatever happened that week um, led me to to give this award. And um, and people and I found that people attended the meetings to see what the awards would be and to see who would get them. And a lot of times there was competition on who had the most loans. So kind of inadvertently, you know, led to some success that way because people were trying to get that award. We also started implementing um, an FAQ review. So when you put together your campaign, you're gonna to put together frequently asked questions about your campaign. But there's like 20 or 30 questions on the list and there's no way you can keep them all you know, active in your mind and in, as in part of your conversation with folks. But some of them are important and critical. And so we review a few of those at each meeting, you know, like, like we pour from the list and talk about them and say, have, have you gotten this question and how did you answer it? Do you have any good suggestions on how to answer it? So that when these questions popped up, people didn't, they didn't feel uncomfortable or freak out. Like, oh my God, I don't know, I, I don't remember. I know I saw that somewhere, but we had just talked about it maybe that week or it was um, more prevalent in their memory and easier for them to respond to. We always talked about what was working well and what was not working. And so the what was working well part was really probably the best part because people were really excited to share their success, how they use this sentence or, or this technique in talking about the owner loan campaign or how they had never thought about something this way and that helped them. And it really allowed us to learn from each other. And then the, the same went with what's not working well, you know, like, oh gosh, I bombed on this. I should have never said that. Um, and, and we found that the team was very open and it helped, I think, as a leader that I was very open and I would be, I would say, you guys, I made a huge mistake. I can't believe I said this or totally stuck my foot in my mouth. Um, and so I think being open and including honest communication about what is working really well and about, um, you know, what you, what you think is not going so well. And, and a lot of times, uh, the what was not working well, we could change. You know, we could, okay, this piece of paper has too many lines to fill out or, you know, I don't understand this workflow. It seems simpler if we would put this here or do this before we did that. And we could change it and make it make it better based on their feedback. And that helped them to feel part of the pro or part of the solution and not just have a problem that we, we didn't know how to fix. And we've talked about food a lot, but we always have food. Always having drinks and food available at the meetings um, made it festive and fun. So we've covered a lot and we, we went in, uh, into detail on a lot. Um, and I've seen a few questions pop up. So I think we'll take some time now to talk through the answers to some of those. Yeah, I wanted to share real quick before we dive in, a lot of these questions relate to things that Katie did cover in her last two her last two webinars with us. So I'm just going to reiterate, check out uh, the names of the webinars are to 1 million and beyond. That's an overview of Katie's project of what went into it, the numbers, the stats, how many volunteers, um, that sort of thing. And then there's another one which we did deep dive, owner loan deep dive 101, where Katie spent a lot of time talking about the setup, getting ready, legal, a lot about building the team, how many volunteers, scheduling people, that sort of thing. So we'll touch on some of these questions. Um, we've got a bunch already coming in. If you have a question, 
please send it to info at fci.coop.coop. Um, and we will get through as many of these as we can. So a lot of these, we're going to touch on them real quick and then point out which webinar um, where you can find out more. But Katie, let's, um, let's jump into how many people did you actually have working on this behind the scenes of your drive uh, during the big push? It sounds like there were dozens of people involved. Yes, there were. Um, probably in each phase of the campaign, there were 25 ish people I, I should go through the list actually and count because we get this question a lot but we had uh, 12 to 14 callers um, and the reason we did that is so that we could ask callers to commit to one night a week so we asked them if you can come once a week on a regular basis we want you and we knew if we were just going to require that minimum commitment we need more people and what we found is that most people came more than once a week um, but they did, you know, if something crazy was happening in their life and they could only get there once that week, they knew that was okay. Uh, so 12 to 14 callers, we had three communication people working on emails, um, graphics, Facebook posts, that kind of thing. We had three volunteers who would rotate um, doing administrative work, you know, processing paperwork, mailing out packets, updating the database. And then we had um closers so folks who were actually processing the loans meeting with callers meeting with owners to actually take checks and um finalize the loan so um it is a lot of people um and and then you know board members are involved to some extent as well outreach so the the number of people involved is, is high okay and and i want to get rid of uh, she touches on how and i know the next question is always how the heck did you get so many people to volunteer i want to point out because katie is modest and won't but this is not a unique community their community doesn't like was beyond normal civically engaged isn't that they have a really high population it's that katie did the work uh to build the team the expectations and and the excitement to be involved so this is attainable for a lot of co-ops i just want to uh, clear quickly clear if i forgot we did rename uh, the first webinar uh, that Katie did, really the overview of the uh, whole campaign. Uh, is actually called the Highest Startup Capital Campaign Yet. I apologize, I had the wrong name. Uh, we're going to jump into the next questions. Um, were your calls made to members only? And how many members did you have at the time when you got started with this campaign? Good question. Um, we had 750 owners when we started phase one of the campaign. We did call only owners in Illinois. Um, at, the, at this time, we were only allowed to do that. Um, so we did contact owners only. And then in phase two, we had 1,100 owners when we started phase two of the campaign. Okay. So I want to point out the laws are different in every state about whether you can offer owner loans, preferred shares. Uh, and now there's the DPO option. But at the time, that this was very specifically done for an owner loan campaign option in the state of Illinois. Um, so you could only offer the loans in state, which is actually pretty much true with preferred shares and DPOs generally as well. So, okay, and uh, notice that again, go back and watch the highest capital campaign ever first. If you're like, wait, there were two stages to your owner loan campaign? Yes, there was a first push and a second push, and Katie talks all about it in that first webinar and how that how that played out. Um, so, uh, next question: uh, How many actual evenings of calling uh, did you guys use to meet your goal? It sounds like this went on for quite a while. Yes, good question. Phase one was eight weeks. We made calls Monday through Thursday nights. We called from 6.30 to 9 p.m. We did not make calls on Friday, but we called Saturday afternoons from 12 to 4 and Sunday afternoons from 12 to 2. So for eight weeks, we did that. We followed that schedule um, for phase one. For phase two, we did the exact same thing, except phase two was four weeks long. And we changed our call time on Sundays from 12 to 2 to 6 to 8 p.m. And that was based on the success um, the, the Bizman Food Co-op had with Sunday night uh, calls. They had completed their capital campaign just as we had. And um, we touched base with them to see what days worked best for them. And they found great success with Sunday night. So we changed Sunday afternoon to Sunday night. And did you find that was a, was a positive change? It was, yeah. Uh, we did get we did get more people home. Um, more people answered their phones on Sunday evening than Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Okay. 
Great. Um, can you share on the resource page your FAQs about the campaign that you went over with your callers? Sure. We can add that. Uh, so there's a link uh, we're going to look, it's going to be here at the end after the Q&A piece uh, that is to every resource that Katie has lent to us uh, so far, so generously shared with us in Green Top Grocery. There it is. Uh, and that's going to have all of the LO resources she shared with us, all the webinars, and we'll keep adding materials if there's pieces you guys asked for today that Katie can can put up for us. Yeah. So if I, if uh, I remember right, Jacqueline, does the, um, the owner loan campaign book, does that include some FAQ samples? It does. And so I, I think uh, I was wondering if those were the final ones or you were saying you could add additional ones. But you have the whole campaign book um, in there and uh, it's already linked. At that link, at that set link, and we'll put we'll put it up again at the very end, uh, so you can in case you didn't write it down. Um, and uh, it, there already are the FAQs that you used with your team. Okay. In there. But are there but are there general FAQs um, in the? I th I'm, not, I'm not saying the word. You know the toolkit, the big book, uh, the campaign toolkit yeah. kit book. I think there are FAQs in there too. And I just mentioned that because. Ours might not be the ones you want to use, and they're you know you can the more you look at options, you know the better the better your your um, final product will be. So look at everyone's FAQ, not just ours. <laughs> uh, all right. So about how many members did each caller have on their list? Hmm. Okay. Good question. That that really for us. So um, the folks who called only once a week. Um, didn't call as many people as the folks who called every day. And we did have callers who came every day. Um, and, and so those people were making, you know, four, 500 calls um, at a time, not at a time, but in a, in a phase of the campaign where uh, someone who comes once a week probably had 50 to 75 owners that they contacted a series of times. Um, but that they managed a smaller number of owners. It's going to depend, and it's going to depend on the person's style too, because a talker is going to talk to less people than someone who's a little more concise. So, kind of got to manage it by the individual and then by their availability. Okay. And you guys can't see, but in the background, we have two wonderful technical support folks. Uh, we have Mary uh, from our Food Co-op Initiative team, as well as Joel's doing our tech support. And Mary says she just went and checked. And yes, the FAQ section is in the Capital Campaign Workbook, which is linked on that link we showed you uh, from Katie. So question, did you get food donations from local places to feed all those volunteers? <laughs> I kind of, I wish we would have. Um, I didn't have time to ask for donations. Hindsight, that might be something to think about ahead of time to line that up before it gets crazy. What did happen um, is that we had owners who would bring us food. So um, we had owners who brought crock pots of soup mm -hmm. for us. We had owners who brought us gallons of ice cream and hot fudge toppings and, you know, kind of Sunday bar kind of things. Um, so our owners ended up taking very good care of us because once, you know, they would come in and make their loan and they'd see, oh my gosh, there's all these people here and they're working so hard and there, there's all this excitement here. And then they'd come back the next week with a load of cookies or so, um, we did not, we did not think about that ahead of time. And I kind of wish I would have, because I, that's a kind of a good marketing opportunity for the business because you're going to take pictures of these people eating their food and you can do a shout out. Thanks to so-and-so bakery for the goodies. So um, that's a really good idea. Yeah. And I want to mention that Katie is a genius at what I call a genius at appreciation. And a lot of co-ops underestimate this. So when people brought soup for the team, they didn't just bring soup for the team. They got a photo taken of them with their soup and it went up on the Facebook and it built this sense of excitement, but it also built the sense that it mattered. That if you as an owner showed up with cookies, if that's all you could do, but you could make a loan, you had contributed. Katie was just awesome and making sure everyone felt appreciated for their contributions and people could see how much they mattered to the whole team. So I just wanted to add that. Um, another question is, you said something about having a budget just for the capital campaign. Can you talk about that? And I think that's a good question. A lot of groups don't set aside an amount of money to run the campaign. So how did that work? Yeah, we did. Um, we, we do have a, a specific budget for each phase of the campaign. 
and you're going to incur a lot of varying expenses and having funds allocated for that and knowing how much it's going to cost you ahead of time is important. Um, it's not a small sum of money. So knowing, you know, what percent of your overall goal are you going to spend on your expenses? Um, we have printing expenses. You know, we printed um, brochures and flyers and um, historical information about Green Top that went to, to all of our owners. And then you have to mail that. So there's postage expenses included in that as well. Uh, we had graphic design expenses. So all of the pretty graphics that you saw, um, you know, we had to a lot. We have a great um, board member who helped us with those. But um, when there were expenses, we wanted to to make sure we took care of those. And then we knew what we wanted to spend um, as far as appreciation for our callers. We knew um, we were going to have we were going to have rent expense. Uh, we are we had to temporarily lo temporarily locate our campaign in another office because we didn't have um, adequate internet service where we were and there was no way to get it updated. Uh, we were a tenant and the landlord wasn't interested in updating the service for us. So we rented temporary space. So we had to allocate for that. And um, you're gonna have to allocate you know, funds for your legal expenses, any consulting fees you plan to can incur as um, you know, as part of your campaign are all going to be part of your budget. And um, we'd be happy to share our budget. I think we, we built our budget based on the work mentioned. And it, it includes a lot of these topics that you're going to want to think through how much, you know, how much you want to spend on each of these things. One tip I will say is that we blew our postage budget out of the water because the materials we plan to send weighed more than we thought they would. So make sure you take it to the post office and know exactly what it's going to cost before you set your budget because it might not be right. <laughs> Great. Well, I think a sample budget, um, we'll get that up on our website. We'll get that from Katie and we'll get that out um, by early next week. Uh, I think that would be really useful because I think a lot of people have not thought through when they're setting up their campaign to the extent you guys did all the things that to be covered. And that leads to one last question I got here, which is, um, Seems like you guys had set office space that you had access to continually. How important was that to your campaign? A lot of groups struggle to find it. Should they really be looking for it? It's critical. Um, I think it was really key to our success. In phase one of the campaign, um, our office and our campaign headquarters were all together, which was very nice. Um, and it was easy. Mm -hmm. All of our documents were in the same place. We didn't have to Outside of locking the filing cabinet, we didn't have to move anything or transport anything. We just locked it all up. And it gave us a place to be together. I talked about that earlier and that fact that making calls uh, in a group setting is very important. It builds energy, helps you learn from each other. And I think it's critical to your success. So in phase one, we were all in one. We had our office location and our campaign headquarters all at the same spot. By the time phase two rolled around, we had changed offices. So at that point, we had our office, and then we had a separate location um, that was the campaign headquarters. Now, that, that space was a little unique in that we had rented a room, like literally like a 10 by 10 room with a desk in it. Now, you can't operate a campaign out of, you know, a desk and a chair. This building that we were in had a conference room that we could have access to. So we reserved that conference room every day from six to nine while we were there. That did increase some of the, I don't, I don't, it's a little more cumbersome because now we had to transport all of our materials from the locked office to the conference room every day, lock them up, sort them out. So mm -hmm. um, I, I strongly recommend you have one space where everyone can be. And it might, maybe it's somebody's basement or, you know, somebody's garage or maybe you can, you might be able to be creative about how and where your space is, but I think having a space is really important. Well, I think it was really a uh, big piece of your guys' success that there was a place people could just drop by during certain yeah. hours and know that they could talk loans, sign paperwork, or bring you cookies. Yep. That's very <laughs> true. That's very true. We wouldn't have gotten cookies if they didn't know where we were. Right. You've got to get cookies. And cookies are clearly key to making your call team happy. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> we got one last question, which is uh, really not a question, which is Katie rocks. You are an inspiration. Uh, <laughs> we agree. 
Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, folks. I think we're going to wrap up for today. And we want to thank Katie again. These have been a phenomenal series of webinars. Uh, again, this is fun. So you can, uh, highest capital campaign, startup capital campaign ever is the first one. That's the overview. Then we've got Owner Loan Deep Dive 101. That's kind of the getting ready to run your campaign. And then this one today, which is 201, which is really about being a campaign manager and running that campaign. Thank you again so much, Katie. We deeply appreciate you. Are you bet. Happy to be here. Thanks for listening. All right, everyone. And we will have another webinar up in October uh, to be announced at this point. And uh, again, there's that link on the screen to where you can find all Katie's materials. Ah, thank you. We're going to show it to you one last time here. Um, these slides will be available on our website at foodcooperative.coop slash slides. Um, and then, of course, there's, on top of that, there's going to be this special page with all of Katie's materials. Have a great day, folks.